Uh, we've been talking today about the narrative, about storytelling, control and lack of control, how smart consumers are today. And that's something we've been spending a lot of time at Ketchum focusing on. And uh, I, I want to introduce someone who I find to be one of the most interesting people I've had the opportunity to meet. Um, I think you'd agree that uh, what we've been talking about a lot today is influence on kind of a mass scale. I hope you'll join us now in taking a look at influence on very much the individual scale. And I hope you agree that taking a look at influence and how our brains interpret information, uh, how consumers make decisions, uh, how they shape their point of view about brands and corporate reputations, uh, how social technologies are changing the way we're influenced is incredibly important. You know, our field has deep roots in the social sciences, and Paul talked about it at the beginning. Uh, but I, you know, think Bernays and Freud. But I think you'd also agree that we uh, could and should apply science to our business more. So about five years ago, my daughter, Erin, said that she wanted to go into neuroscience. And while we have been investing in consulting relationships with social scientists, I needed to learn more about this field, so I read a number of books and attended seminars, and the more that I read, including some international bestsellers from our next guest, the more I read, the more I realized that a lot of the, what we perceive to be knowledge about opinion formation, which is a big part of our business, and about how consumers decide was frankly flawed and inaccurate, including the idea that we use only 10% of our brain, which as you'll find, from our next guest, uh, it couldn't be more inaccurate. So I wanted to introduce you to, to David, who is outstanding, because I think he's going to bring, he's a great bridge between neuroscience and its relevance to our business. So Dr. David Eagleman is uh, the head of the Laboratory for Perception and Action at Baylor College of Medicine. He has degrees from Baylor University, from Baylor College of Medicine. He's a Guggenheim Fellow, spent a year at Oxford University. He's the author of the best-selling book, Incognito, The Secret Lives of Our Brain. The book, Why the Net Matters, uh, which is not as obvious as you might think, and of another international bestseller called Some. He's gonna to talk to us for about 20 minutes, and then if we have time, we're gonna open up for, uh, for some questions from all of you. So please join me in welcoming Dr. David Eagleman. Thanks, Rob. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here, uh, and I get to talk to you about what my passion is, the human brain. Uh, as far as we can tell, we're the only species on the planet that's grown so sophisticated that we've thrown ourselves headlong into this game of trying to decipher our own programming language. So this would be as if your computer started controlling its own peripheral devices and pulled off its cover and pointed its webcam at its own circuitry to try to figure out what it's made out of. That's the situation we're in. And what we found under the hood there is the most complicated device that we've ever found in the universe. So the human brain is about three pounds and it contains tens of billions of neurons. Neurons are the specialized cell types in the brain. And each neuron is as complicated as the city of Miami. Every neuron has the entire human genome in it, and it's trafficking millions of proteins around with all sorts of signals. And these are connected to each other in such density that it bankrupts the language, and we have to invent new types of mathematics to even talk about it. There are hundreds of trillions of connections between these neurons. And what that means is, if you took a cubic centimeter of brain tissue, there are as many connections in there as there are stars in the Milky Way galaxy. So it's a tremendously complex system. The really interesting part about it is, somehow, this vast, wet biological network is you. It's your hopes, your dreams, your aspirations, your decision making, the agony, the ecstasy, all of that is contained in this three pounds of wet biological gushy stuff. Now, how do we know that? How do we know it's not contained in, in uh, your, your pinky, for example? Well, the answer is, if you were to damage your pinky in a car accident, you'd be sad about it, but you'd be no different. But if you damage an equivalently sized chunk of brain tissue, that can change you entirely. That can change your, uh, your decision making, your risk aversion, your ability to name animals or understand music or see colors or any of a hundred other things. And that's how we know that somehow you are your brain. Now, the most interesting part to me about this whole thing 
is that somehow all of this is running under the hood of conscious awareness. These vast operations of your brain are happening in a place where you can't even access them. You're not even acquainted with what's going on down there. So if I lift a bottle of water to my mouth, that's actually underpinned by a lightning storm of brain activity, but it's totally invisible to me. I'm not aware of any of that. All I know is whether I spilled the water on myself or made it to the target, right? And it's not just the bottle of water. It's everything in your life. It's getting a joke. It's recognizing a friend's face. It's falling in love. It's deciding what brand you're going to go with. All of this stuff is underpinned by lightning storms of brain activity, and yet it's completely running under the hood, and you're not acquainted with it. And that's what leads to this notion of the unconscious. And it turns out that the stuff your brain is doing unconsciously is the vast majority of it. And the conscious part of you, the part that flickers to life when you wake up in the morning, that's the smallest bit of what's happening in the brain. That's the broom closet in the mansion of the brain. The analogy I used in my last book, Incognito, is that the conscious mind is like a stowaway on a transatlantic steamship that's taking credit for the whole journey without acknowledging the massive engineering that's underfoot. So think about it when you have an idea and you say, oh, I just thought of something. It wasn't exactly you that thought of it. Your brain's been working on that behind the scenes for hours or days, consolidating information, putting things together, trying things out. Eventually, it comes up with something, serves it up to you, and you say, oh, I'm a genius. But it wasn't exactly you, right? So this led uh, Carl Jung to say, in each of us, there is another whom we do not know. Or as Pink Floyd put it, there's someone in my head, but it's not me. So I'll give you an example of this. This was a, a study done some years ago where, where men were asked to rate the attractiveness of women's faces in photographs. So they rated from 1 to 10 how attractive they thought the woman was. And what the men didn't know is that in half of the photographs, the women's eyes had been dilated with some eye drops. And so what happened is the men uniformly found the women with the dilated eyes to be more attractive. But the important part is that none of the men said oh, I noticed her pupil was a millimeter larger over here. None of them noticed that. And, and crucially, none of the men knew that dilated eyes is a, is a biological sign of sexual readiness in women. But their brains knew it. And here they were, making the right sorts of decisions, completely unconsciously. But the why was all of these deep evolutionary programs that were running under the hood and steering their behavior appropriately without them being aware of why they were making those decisions. And of course, love always goes this way, right? You find yourself attracted to some people more than others, or some companies or brands more than others, and you don't know why, but there are lots of things running under the hood that you don't have access to. I'll give you a couple of examples of this because it's so interesting, these influences in our lives. It turns out that if your name is Dennis or Denise, you are more likely to become a dentist. And this is because of something that psychologists call implicit egotism. We like things that remind us of ourselves. For example, you, you like people who share your birthday better, even though that's completely arbitrary, right? But anyway, you might agree this is a terrible reason to choose a life profession. Um, but you can prove to yourself that this is true by going through the professional dental registries in any state and, and showing that this is the case. The thing is this, if you asked any of these dentists or Denises why they became a dentist, they would have some sort of conscious narrative they would tell you about. They like teeth and it's a good profession and so on, but they don't have access to some of these deeper drives that are pushing them there and that we can only find by looking at things statistically and measuring what's happening in the brain. Similarly to this, it turns out that you are more likely to marry somebody whose first name begins with the same first letter as your first name. So Joe and Jenny, or Donnie and Daisy, or Alex and Amy. It turns out if you go through the marriage registries in any county, you can prove to yourself this is true. Well, that's a terrible reason to choose a life mate, right? And if you ask any of these people what their conscious narrative is, this wouldn't be included. And yet, the influence is there and driving them. And this is on so many things in our life, even how we, how we think we feel about things. So um, if you are holding a, a warm mug of coffee, you will describe your relationship with your mother as closer than if you're holding an iced coffee, right? It's an unconscious influence. You're not even aware of these bodily signals driving how you believe you feel about things. So what this means is there's this enormous gap 
between what your brain is doing and what your mind has access to. And the question is, why is there this giant gap? Well, it's exactly what you want there to be, because the conscious mind is essentially like a newspaper. And when you pick up a paper, there, there are so many things happening in the United States of America right now. Political movements and factories running and cops chasing criminals and phone calls. You don't want to know all that stuff. All you want to know is the headline. So you pick up a newspaper, and that's what a newspaper headline tells you, is did I get the water to my mouth, what's happening in the nation, stuff like that, and it just tells you what's going on. And it's exactly the way you'd want it. Why? Because, because if you had access to all those details of what's actually happening under the hood, it's too much. And another analogy to this is that the conscious mind is like the CEO of a company. And if, if you're the CEO of a really large company, like I flew here on United Airlines, you know, Jeff Smizek, I always watch those videos every time he comes. He doesn't want to know what's running in every cubicle and every refueling station. He can't possibly know that. His job as CEO is to think about the long-term vision of the company and assume that all the machinery of the company beneath him is running just fine. And when something goes wrong, then he gets an alert telling him that he's got to pay attention to something. But otherwise, he has to depend on everything going on just fine. And I'll give you an example of of the, the, the reason why you don't want the conscious mind interfering down below. So I'd like everyone to hold up two dry erase markers. So hold up the markers in front of you. Go ahead and hold up your pens in front of you. Okay, put down your blackberries and things like that. Okay, hold them up. Now I want you to sign your, your name forward and backwards. So do your signature in the air forward and backwards. <laughs> Some people are paralyzed. <laughs> Um, okay. <laughs> okay. Some of you did better than others. And um, it, turns out, it turns out, next time you're at a dry erase board, try this. It's very easy to do if you don't think about it. But as soon as you start thinking about it, you're dead. As soon as the conscious mind gets involved in it, it just, you can't do it. And if any of you play a musical instrument, you know this to be true, that as soon as you start paying attention to where your fingers are going, you're dead. You can't do it anymore because the the conscious mind not only doesn't have access to most of what's going on down there, but, but screws it up if, if it tries to get down there. Um, and in fact, in, uh, here, here's a sort of insider neuroscience trick that you can take home with you, which is if you're ever losing at tennis and you want to win, there's always a nefarious way to win, which is you just compliment your opponent on his serve and you say, you serve so well, how exactly do you do it? As soon as he starts thinking about it, he's completely dead. He can't do it anymore. Okay. Um, and I, I'm just going to give you one more example because it's so fascinating, I think, about how little access we actually have. So I'd like everyone to put up your hands on your steering wheel. So you're, you're driving along. Okay, put down, put down the Blackberry over there. Put your hands on your steering wheel. You're driving along. I want you to make a left lane change. So you're going to 30 miles an hour. I want you to move over to your left lane. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. I didn't see anyone use their blinker, but that's okay. The... Um, <laughs> Okay, as far as I could see, as far as I could see, everyone did it exactly wrong. So everyone that I saw banked the wheel to the left and then back to the center. Okay, that would drive you off onto the sidewalk. So you've just crashed into the sidewalk. The way you make a lane change is you go to the left, back to the center, just as far to the right, and back to center again. That's what a lane change looks like. And you do it every day, and you don't even know how you do it. Because there's so much operating under the hood, you don't even have access to or any awareness of. So what this means is that pretty much everything happening in your cognition is happening incognito. You don't have access to it. And the strange part is that our brains serve up this reality to us, and we accept whatever, whatever we're seeing. So an interesting example of this is, is what happens with vision. So you, you open your eyes, and there's the world with all its shapes and colors and blues and golds, and, and, and it seems effortless. You just open your eyes, and you're looking at the world. But the only reason it seems effortless is because so much brain power is devoted to it. There's so much happening under the hood, and um, it turns out that it, it, us describing what vision is like and reality is like would be like a fish trying to describe water. We've never seen anything else, and so it, it's hard to even get a sense of it until you see a bubble come up past. And bubbles to, to neuroscientists are things like visual illusions, which tell us, wow, there's stuff happening that we weren't even aware of. So, so for example, if you look at the top surface and the bottom surface, you'd agree that the top surface is dimmer, right? Okay, so it's, if I cover up the middle gradient there, you'll see that they're exactly the same. Now, what I'd like you to do is hold up your finger to cover up that middle bit so that you can see that I'm not pulling any tricks. You can cover up that middle bit yourself. And what you see is that the top and bottom surface are exactly the same in terms of their brightness. 
But because of that gradient in the middle, your brain makes up all sorts of decisions and serves it up to you, and you accept whatever reality your brain serves up to you. Right? So you think that those are actually different surfaces when they're the same. And as another example of this, who would believe me that that top middle square and the front middle square are exactly the same color? They're exactly the same, and if I cover up everything else, you'll see that they're identical. I'm not doing anything funny here except for covering this up. The reason that your brain thinks they're different colors when they're not covered up is because of all the surrounding colors and the shadow and the light. And, and what's happening is your brain makes all sorts of sophisticated computation about what the best answer is about the colors. And it's doing all that without any, act, without any awareness on your part that those computations are happening. OK. And it turns out that the stuff you look right at, you don't even see most of what's right at, on your eyes. So I'll just give you an example. So I'm going to show you two versions of this picture, version A and version B. And I just want you to raise your hand when you see what the difference is. Don't shout it out. Just raise your hand when you, when you see what the difference is between version A and version B. OK, two people. Three, OK. <laughs> For those of you who haven't seen it, note the rail in the back that's moving a foot every time. Right? That's been sitting on your eyes the entire time, and you didn't even see it. Which is weird, right? How could you not notice something so enormous like that? Well, what this illustrates is that you don't actually see, you don't just open your eyes and have vision work like a camera and you see what's out there. All you ever see is your internal model of what you believe is out there. And in this case, you thought, okay, it's a man and a woman and they're having some food and there's a meadow behind them. And that's all you actually see until you start paying more and more attention to the details. For those of you who didn't do so well in the last one, I'll give you one more shot here. Raise your hand when you see what the difference is between A and B. OK, because our time is limited, it's just the 10,000 pound jet engine under the wing there that's appearing and disappearing every time. <laughs> OK, OK. So it's strange, right? The point is that we accept the reality that is presented to us by our brains, and we don't usually have any access into why that's happening. And, and I mean, what's strange about this to me is if it weren't for neurobiology, we wouldn't even have, I mean, take lifting the bottle of water, you wouldn't even have the reason to suspect the existence of muscles and nerves and electrical signals and all that. You wouldn't even think any of that's going on. And that's essentially what our field is studying is, wow, what is really happening when we look at the machinery underneath there? Um, okay, that's point one I wanted to make. I want to make a couple more very short points, and then Rob and I are going to chat. So the second point I want to make is that when you think about a person, you think about yourself and how you make decisions, it seems like, okay, well, there's me. I am a single decision maker. But in fact, that's not the right way to think about the brain. Your brain is made up of lots of competing subparts that are always battling it out to control your behavior. So the right way to think about the brain is like a neural parliament where you've got all these different political parties and they're fighting it out to steer the ship of state. So, so, uh, so in Incognito, I talk about this as a team of rivals, which is to say sometimes the subparts in your brain agree on things and, and often they disagree and they're fighting it out. And however that battle ends up tipping, that's the way you end up behaving. So for example, if I were to put some warm chocolate chip cookies in front of you, part of your brain wants to eat that because it's a rich energy source. And part of your brain says, don't eat it, you're going to get fat. And then you can argue with yourself, who's talking to whom here? How is it that you can cajole yourself, you can contract with yourself, you can get angry at yourself? It's strange, right? But that's the issue, is that you're made up of lots of competing parts, and decisions aren't just, okay, well, I've got a single mind, and here's what I'm doing. Instead, it has to do with the outcome of the, the battles in the internal parliament. So what we've been doing in neuroscience for the last uh, decade and a half is, is looking inside people's heads with technology called magnetic resonance imaging, in this case. And um, this allows us to peer non-invasively into people's heads while they're doing decision-making tasks and they're thinking about which thing they're going to go for and why and how and so on. And I'll just summarize the last 10 years of what we've learned in terms of decision-making in one slide, which is that when people are trying to make a decision between options, 
there are competing neural networks that we can actually measure and, and understand what's going on. So you have one set of areas in the brain, one network that cares about valuation, that cares about things like price point. You have another network in the brain that cares about emotional experience. You have another network in the brain that cares about social context. It cares about what your friends think. It depends whether the thing is cool or lame. And, and none of these by itself gets to drive decision making. They're fighting it out, right? So when you're standing in front of the ice cream section at the supermarket and you're trying to decide which one you want, it's not just one thing happening. It's this battle between these and, and, and other networks as well, although, although I think these are the main ones in terms of uh, consumer decision making. And so the key thing is that these are always in conflict with one another. So that's, the, that's point number two that I wanted to make. The very last thing I'll say, just in closing, is you know, there was this Greek admonition to know thyself. And I think as we move forward, it's really this issue about knowing thyselves and understanding the whole, all the different political parties that drive your behavior, or in this case, that drive consumer behavior. And I, I just want to say one thing in closing because I find this interesting, which is that sometimes when we think about the fact that we're not really the ones driving our own boat, um, that sometimes seems depressing to some people. And they think, wow, I thought, you know, I feel like I'm not at the center of myself anymore. But the interesting part is we have a historical analogy here, which is in, uh, in, in the 1600s when Galileo discovered the moons of Jupiter and realized that the Earth was not at the center of all the orbits, critics decried this as a dethronement of man from his position at the center. And they were very depressed about this. But I would suggest that dethronements have a real upside, which is that what's happened is in the last 400 years since Galileo, we've discovered that the universe is so much more wondrous and subtle and grand than we could have ever imagined back when we thought we were right at the center. And I suggest the same thing is happening in cognitive neuroscience, which is that as we sail into this inner cosmos and we find all sorts of strange alien life forms, what we're realizing is that this whole system is so much more wondrous and grand and subtle than we could have ever imagined. And the bottom line is that we have found the most amazing thing in the universe, and it is us. So thanks very much for your attention, and now I'm going to chat with Rob and throw in any questions that you want. Well, I, I hope you can see why I wanted you to meet David. Um, and we've had some great conversations, and I just want to draw out a few more things and then hopefully get some questions from all of you. Um, how do, uh, we, we've been talking a lot about messaging and actions and the performance of brands and corporations and getting people's attention. How do people really see brands and corporations? You know, I mean, um, I've been running some studies in my lab lately where what we're looking at is <clears throat> how people view corporations versus how they view other humans, other individuals. And the hypothesis I went in there with, it looks like it's exactly right, which is that we don't have any special brain circuitry to understand companies. We use the same circuitry that we use for understanding people. In other words, to the brain, companies are just like people. And what that means is that all the same issues apply. Trust and integrity and reputation, the same way that you choose your friends and you choose who you want to hang out with and so on. That's exactly how we view companies. There's no, there's no special circuitry that allows companies to be different. And so, and so the lesson for companies is obvious here. And I've heard it this morning. I mean, I've heard people touching on this from, from many different angles, which is that companies need to do all the same things that you would do to, to maintain your friends. And so in, you know, in classical economics, um, uh, you know, some sort of exchange is viewed as, a, as just a short-term market exchange. But, but in fact, it's got to be more like, um, more like a reputation, more like something that you do with a friend. It's not just a one-shot deal and then the person's off. It'll be a repeated thing where, where you're, who you are matters as a company. Here's another one, a little bit of a shift. Um, I know you've studied quite a bit about how creative ideas come to us. Uh, a lot of the people in this audience, I think, can be called uh, experts in creativity. Spend a lot of time brainstorming, coming up with ideas. Can you share anything about your perspective on getting to great ideas or, or anything that you've learned on that? Yeah. Um, um, let me say two things about that. One is, 
I've been thinking a lot about creativity lately and what it is, and for, for, for someone to be a good creative thinker actually means that they need to generate lots of ideas and rigorously be able to filter and throw out most of them. That's what creative thinking is about. But, so it's really a two-part process. But the thing that's been interesting to me in the context of the unconscious brain is, is the following. Actually I'd, like to, actually, I'd like to start with an exercise to answer this question, which is, um, what I'd like everybody to do is picture yourself, imagine yourself standing on the beach at sunset. Okay, do you have that imagined pictured? Okay, how many people included in their imagination um, birds flying around in the sky? Okay, how many people imagine, let's say, some, some coconut husks on the beach? Okay, how many people imagine the white foam tips of the waves? How many people imagined a, 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 moon, a crescent moon up in the sky in the background? Okay, so this is a group of super creative people, and there were very few hands here. Why? Well, what happens is, when I ask you to picture standing on a beach at sunset, your brain goes to the most obvious thing it can with as few details as possible. The unconscious brain is ruthlessly efficient. It always takes the path of least resistance. And even though you've got all those connections in there, and I can sort of guide you to imagery where you put all these things in there, you're not going to come up with that by yourself. Why? Because the brain is all about solving problems. And if, you know, in evolutionary time, if you're hungry, you got to go find food. You don't want to paint or dance or do other things. And so that's why the brain always chooses the path of least resistance. And starting with guys like Leonardo da Vinci, they realized if you want to be a good creative thinker, what you have to do is always reject whatever the first idea is. Da Vinci was famously suspicious of whatever the first thing his, his mind sent to him. And, um, and you got to push it back and demand something better because all kinds of rich associations are down in there in those neural networks. But if you just trust the first thing that comes out, it's always going to be representative of the path of least resistance. We talked a little bit about our crowdsourcing platforms that catch them, Mindfire and Ideate. And you had a great question about whether we assign roles. Yeah, one of the really important things, I think, with group creative thinking is this idea of assigning different roles where some people's role is just to throw out anything they want. Other people's roles are to be sort of the financial bad guy and say that'll never work for the following reason. Other people are, let's say, the emotional person who just, whose role is to say, okay, well, that makes me feel good, that makes me feel bad, just give that sort of feedback. Other people are meant to just be the critic and say why it's a bad idea. And, and what, what you do then is you play these different roles and then you switch up those roles. There are various versions. Of, some of you may know about six hats thinking. It's a technique for this where people sort of wear these imaginary hats. The, the person in the green hat is the one coming up with the crazy ideas. Anything goes. He's not supposed to filter his idea. The one in the black hat does the financial, uh, reasonable uh, decision making and so on. And, and, then, you know, and then everyone switches hats. So there are various versions of doing this, but I think it's a really useful way instead of everybody um, feeling like they're playing all those roles at once. I mean, it's very useful, for example, to have the green hatter just throw out the craziest whatever ideas as opposed to everybody thinking, well, what will my colleagues think of me if I say this kind of idea and so on. But by playing roles, you're really freed up to, to get a lot more space. I'll take a question from the audience in a second. I do want to go back to the cookies that you had up there and this notion that your brain is kind of having an argument all the time. In your book, you talk about retirement funds and, and that being another setting for that. Can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, one of, one of the biggest conflicts in, in the team of rivals in your brain is issues between short and long term. And so people come to these fascinating ways of dealing with this internal conflict. So with the cookies, you could say, all right, you know, party wants to eat it, party doesn't want to eat it. So you can say, all right, I tell you what, I'll contract with myself or if I eat it, I'll promise my spouse that I'll go to the gym tomorrow. And so it's, it's like these two parties fighting it out and figuring out way, ways to deal with each other. But what's interesting um, about the way people make decisions in time has to do with the power of, of now. Let me give you an example of this. Let's say I were to offer you $100 now versus $110 in a week from now. So who's going to take the $100 right now? And who's going to take the $110 in a week from now? Okay, not everyone voted. Let's do this one more time. Who's taking the $100 now? 
Okay, and who's taking the $110 in a week from now? Okay, now let's say I change this up. Now I say, look, in a year from now, in 52 weeks, I'll give you $100. Or in 53 weeks, I'll give you $110. So who's going to take the $100 in 52 weeks? And who's going to take the $110 in 53 weeks? <laughs> okay, so there's this major preference reversal there. The thing I want you to notice, it's exactly the same gamble. I'm asking, is waiting one week of time worth $100 to you? And if it's off in the future, you're totally willing to wait that extra week. But if it's right now, you want the $100. And you're not going to wait. So this is very interesting. Uh, um, a guy named Daniel Kahneman won the Nobel Prize for, for understanding these sorts of cognitive illusions. But at the, bottom, at the bottom, what we have is that there's this real seduction to now. And anything in the future... Um, is sort of obscured in the mists of the future, and people don't care about that as much. And so that leads to all sorts of interesting behaviors with people. And of course, things like retirement accounts is where you know you try to get people to, you know, you try to encourage people to put money away now because otherwise they'll spend it. This is why Christmas uh, bank accounts work, where you have people put away their money right now because they know that if they don't, they'll spend it. And so they're coming up with essentially contracts for themselves so that they can manage their own bad behavior. We have a question over here. Yeah, my question is essentially on the ethics of using what we know. I mean, good marketing appeals to the subconscious. But as we know more about the subconscious and how to make it kick in, where should the line be drawn between what is legitimate to do and what isn't legitimate to do? Thank you for that question. I think there's two important things to say there. One is that... Um, <laughs> marketers and advertisers are a century ahead of neuroscientists on this. Um, in some sense, neuroscience is always just trying to catch up to figure out why these things work. Um, but things about, you know, putting uh, uh, pretty people in ads and, and implying that you'll have pretty friends like this if you use this product, like all that stuff, marketers are way ahead of, of neuroscience. on. So I don't think we're actually contributing anything um, that's sort of a, a, a new secret trap door there. And one thing that I'm quite pleased about, actually, is the way that our data has come out in the end, which is that the bottom line is that since we view corporations as people, the most important thing for corporations are to act with trust and integrity. And, and that's a really, that's a message that I, as a neuroscientist, am very happy to, to conclude on. So, so to my mind, there's no ethical problem with that. I love the question, though. Thank you. Thanks, we have a question over here. Yeah, my question is about the brain process in terms of assimilating information. We all now have multiple gadgets, and we know the focus and attention span is divided. Has that changed the neurobiology of the brain in terms of how one learns or one deals with information intake? Yeah, um, and this has, of course, been one of the big questions on the mind of every parent in the world, which is, what is happening with this next generation? The, the bottom line is, yes, it changes the brain physically, measurably. The digital generation has a different brain than we do who, who grew up uh, pre-internet. And so, um, and this is measurable in all sorts of ways. Just as one example, the ways that your eyes, you know, the way your eyes pass over a page is totally unconscious to you. If you watch someone else's eyes, you'll see it makes all these leaps around, but they don't know what their eyes are doing. But it turns out that children of the digital generation, their eyes actually move around in a different way than adults. Um, and the way we look at a page is we sort of scan the text like that. Uh, a, a, digital gen a digital native will look at a page that their eyes sort of first move around the edges and then sort of make these little forays into the middle, exactly the way a web page is laid out. So, um, so there are physical deep changes in the brain. Um, the, the, the consequence of it, of course, is obvious, which is that everybody expects information in a much faster way. Um, the nice part is that storytelling still matters, and the way to get any information into the brain um, is still, you're still looking for the story-shaped hole uh, there, and cast, you know, if, if you want to get anything into anyone's brain, even though you have to have it much faster now, um, it's still, you have to wrap things in narrative to get it in there. That's the part that hasn't changed. Yeah. Here's, here's another one right here. Thank you. Um, I think from a communications perspective, what interests me is if you're trying to influence behavior, uh, are you more likely to do so by communicating using the sort of path of least resistance that you talked about, where maybe you go with the obvious insight into consumer behavior? 
or are you more likely to get people to sort of stand up and notice and actually act upon that if you come up with something that's just totally out of left field? That's Oh, left field. Um, yes, uh, my intuition on that would be the left field because it's really hard, this relates to the previous question, it's really hard to grab people's attention now. Um, so, so things coming out of left field tend to be quite successful in that way, that you at least get the moment to grab the person's attention. So uh, that's, that's the one I would vote for there. I don't know if there is a way to do the path of least resistance on, on the input. It's only, that's only a matter of what comes out on the output. Here's one. Hi there. I've been a fan since I heard you at South by Southwest, and I love all your books. Thank you. So I'm a Jewish middle-aged groupie. <laughs> um, can you talk to us a little bit about the work you're doing now in your lab and how it might apply to our work? Yeah, I mean, essentially what I'm looking at with these issues of, of the unconscious brain and how people actually make decision, the thing that interests me about it is the way that traditional market research goes, which is that you ask people, okay, why do you like this brand over that brand? Why did you make the... Who the hell... Not? They're going to come up with some sort of conscious narrative, but it's not going to be true, and it's not because they're purposefully lying, but because they don't have access to what's going on under there. And it feels to me like... Really, the answer is for, for corporations to figure out, all right, look, how do we maximize along all of these axes? How do we make sure that, that we uh, have the right valuation for our product? How do we make sure we've got the right emotional experience for our product? And how do we make sure that it's socially cool? And, and, and if any corporation can max along those three dimensions, then they're probably doing pretty well. But, but I do worry, I think, about, about traditional market research where you ask people why they did what they did, because you're just never going to get the right answer there. You know, a lot of the folks in this room would have a great answer to the question, why does the internet matter? Because we're working with it every day. Radical transparency, speed of information flow, connecting people in new ways. You have a slightly different answer in kind of a historical context. Can you... Well, that's right. I'm sort of a history buff. So I wrote a book called Why the Net Matters, looking at it in, on sort of the 10,000-year time scale about the collapse of civilizations before us and what has, what, if you look at all the civilizations that have collapsed, what, they, what issues they have in common. And then the argument in the book is that the advent of this rapid networking system has completely changed those equations so that we're unlikely to collapse for the same reasons. There might be other reasons that we fall as a civilization, but, but it ain't what happened before. Um, and, and a big part of that uh, has to do with the speed of information transfer, which I think matters, matters to everybody in this room, too. Um, I mean, just one example about the Internet and civilization is, you know, epidemics have brought down a lot of civilizations before us. But what we have now is the capacity to disseminate information very quickly, also have people work from home when an epidemic hits. All you need to do is reduce the population density below some tipping point, and that's all you need to stave off an epidemic. But anyway, it, it's the speed of information that's so important. So you guys may know whenever a, an epidemic hits, the Center for Disease Control um, collects up from hospitals how many flu reports they have. So they do this all the time, and that's how they know where the flu is happening so they can distribute resources. But this lags the real flu by two weeks because it takes time to collect it. So what Google did is Google said, look, what if we just look at where people are searching on the symptoms of flu? And we look at where people are typing in these search queries, and Google can figure out where the flu is with, with less than a day lag. So it's very clever. And then you can distribute resources appropriately. The thing that I think is important maybe in, this, in today's context is the speed at which information can move. So um, a lot of previous civilizations have been brought down because information didn't move fast enough. I'll just give one example, which is Pompeii, when Vesuvius blew the volcano there was a big pyroclastic flow that headed towards Pompeii and eventually swamped it. Um, and I made a calculation that if the Pompeians had the internet, they could have easily walked 12 kilometers to the southeast and been saved, right? It, it turns out that information is traveling so fast now, and that's changing everything that we know. Of course, the, how news works, the, 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 the central news stations aren't the ones who are disseminating the information about forest fires, as well as people who are geotagging, uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook pics and so on. Um, I, how this matters for corporations is that breaches of trust travel fast. So I mentioned before that one of the most important things to a corporation is to have trust and integrity and so on. I'm sure everyone in this room knows, remembers this thing with United Airlines where they broke this guy's guitar. He made a YouTube video song called United Breaks Guitars. The Economist uh, estimated that it lost United $10 million 
um, because the YouTube video got 1.3 million hits very rapidly. And so um, the thing is that consumers have a voice now in a way that they never had before, and it travels really fast. And I think that's you know, the most important thing about the net for companies to keep in mind. Great. Um, you have a new book coming out. What's it called? Um, I have a couple coming up, but Live, okay. Wire, Live Wired is one of the, that, that one's about brain plasticity, which is how the brain always reconfigures its own circuitry, how it's always, uh, 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 you know, even when you're an adult, you're rewriting everything that's going on in there. Well, we'll look forward to that. And one of the things I love about David's work is that it causes us to fundamentally rethink some of the assumptions we make about the way our consumers perceive the world around them. Um, I love that you made your presentation uh, accessible to us. He does a lot of presentations at big neuroscience co conventions. And uh, thank you for relating it to the world of marketing and communications. Please join me in thanking Dr. David Eagleman. Thank you so much. Terrific. Thanks, Ron. <laughs>